Um, so I think in these times, like in creating that transition, again, like everything is uncertain. So you really don't have anything to lose by trying something that's completely different from the way you normally do things, right? So like, you know, if you feel like the only thing you know how to do is smoke weed and drink pat Ron and play cards with the homies, but now you can't do that because you lost your job, the liquor store closed at seven and coronavirus, y'all can't play no spades. Like, do something different, right? Okay, so what you know how to do with that? It, like, create transferable skills. So if you know that you're the best person on the weed table that know how to roll up, you know how to make good drink, and you the spades master, Think about that. Okay, cool. Like, I'm about to watch this YouTube and I'm going to build me an app that teach people how to play spades that can allow people to have a good time socially distant. And, you know, I'm going to build me a YouTube channel where I'm going to teach people the effect of using herbal substances to, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to do research behind, like, why do I smoke weed in the hood, right? Like, where did this come from? What are the what are the actual advantages of using marijuana? Like, like learn something, right? You might mess around and be like, all right, boom, I'm going to school to study botany because I'm a I'm gonna do this, right? <laughs> like, you don't lose nothing by trying something in times of uncertainty. No, oh, that's that's I I do. I really do appreciate how you like encourage people stepping outside of their comfort zone, but also using the things that they know, like you're not staying in your comfort zone, but you're using what you know to then create a pathway through something new. And that like, that's like, that that's really cool. Look, if you can make an app to teach people how to play spades, I appreciate it. Cause people don't taught me three times and I still don't know how. And I had that Man, you went to an HBCU to <laughs> with my black card like rip it up it's it is gone i ain't got no hole punches left it's i i'm no it's 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 a wrap i get it i get it i have so i know like for me in this corona season right like and obviously like as therapists we you know i not to make this like a hierarchy but we definitely are like Unrec like mental health practitioners are the unrecognized heroes of like frontline workers you know because the truth is like we are not like we are kind of helping keep people physically well right because some physical manifestations that would normally send people to the healthcare system can be resolved with being attentive to mental health right chest pains especially anxiety depression back problems right like joint anything um but like, I know for me as a practitioner, um, one of the things that was like, okay, um, I can't, you know, because it's, it's illegal to take inmates home with you guys, okay? Now that the cat's out of the bag. Um, but I was like, I feel creatively constipated. Like I cannot do therapy with the offenders that I service the way that I normally do it, right? I mean, prison already puts the barrier on the way you can do therapy. Um, but then when we have to shift offices around or, you know, I can't see my offenders as frequently, um, because, you know, I know that they're going to be okay, but as a, as a staff member, I have to make that call. Like, do I care more about your physical safety and doing my best that I can to keep you safe since I'm coming in and out of the prison every day? Or do I, you know, selfishly want to continue treatment the way that I want to do it because I know that it's helping. Right. So I really had to pull back some which has caused me creative constipation in a sense it's like i'm i want to do these things i want to help you but i also at the end of the day i have a duty to keep as many people safe as possible and so what i did was i'm like okay um i really realized that they're oh like in black, with black people, like we can talk about all of the systematic oppression about why there's not enough access to mental health care, but I'll be here all day. Um, but I was like, you know, I want to create something that says people need these therapeutic skills, but if you can't get to therapy, here's a way that you can still be well. Um, so I started creating something called the Mindset Moguls Meditation Journal, which I hope to like 
drop for my birthday next month is almost done. Um, but I was like, okay, what is a way that I can use journal exercises? What I started doing was uh, Ohio was getting really technologically savvy. So we have a system called a kite system where we can actually send inmates messages. Um, and so my offenders that I knew were benefiting from processing, I would like give them weekly prompts that they can just use if they don't even have a pencil or paper, like they can meditate on them and then they can send their responses back to me. So I'm like, what if I put this in a journal, right? Like, okay, you don't want to come to therapy. You feel like you can't afford therapy. You a single mom working three jobs. You don't got time to come to therapy. You a dad trying to be on your grind and take care of your kids. You don't got time to come to therapy. Your mama don't believe in therapy because she, you know, I believe in Jesus and therapy. I love God. I cuss a little bit and I drink a little more wine than I need to. We don't get a few. I love God. I'm on fire for the Lord. And, um, you know, so what, like all of these barriers, like how can I find a way to get people the information that I feel like they need to have to be mentally well outside of the barriers and confines of the office, right? Like what does therapy look like in the margins, you know? And so I've taken, like, and the more that I connect it to like my purpose, I'm like, I've always been that way. I've always been like, what can I give people that they don't have access to that still want to help them, right? So when I was a kid, that was me like, mom, can we please give somebody this on the side of the road, this cheeseburger? And she was like, fine, you know? Um, but now as an adult, it's like, how many people can I give them the tools even if they don't want to come to therapy, mm -hmm. right? Like how many people can I at least get them to shift regularly the way that they think and reframe right because you can come to therapy and I can tell you about cognitive behavioral therapy and the reframing process we can walk through all 12 of the cognitive distortions and thinking errors you know if you got a little trauma we can do some you know exposure therapy or cognitive process and therapy you got a personality disorder or some self-injurious behavior we can talk about dbt but the truth is some people don't want to come to therapy they don't got time the money the resources or the accessibility to come to therapy but these are the people that are most critically in need of the tool yeah. right so you can buy a 25 dollar journal right and if you want to smoke your weed while you write your journal have at it right and so I'm like, okay, I need to find more ways to get people the tools, um, but not underestimate my own craft, right? Because I do a lot of stuff for free, but I can't do everything for free. But my burden is bigger than my bank account. You know, be, like at the end of the day, my burden is what fuels my purpose. And my burden, I, I feel the most sad. I feel the most crippling when I feel people not be able to win mentally. Mm. And so if it ever come down to me seeing somebody crippled by mental health versus me getting a check, like forget the check. Because I'm not going to feel well if I know that I have the keys to unlock what you need and I'm not going to give it to you. Like I, I literally won't. I will literally be sick to my stomach if I know that I got the the monopoly pieces to the board game you're trying to play and I'm not gonna help you. See, and that's that's why you have that conviction, because you actually care. And for the people who do go to therapy, and if your therapist doesn't share this conviction or have more of an investment than you getting better, they taking up your time talking about their problems and stuff. It happens, it happens. We ain't gonna go too much into it, but it happens. Find people who are in your corner. Just because they're in that chair doesn't mean they're in your corner. It's a mm -hmm. process, but do it. And like you said earlier, mental health care workers are holding people together on all levels of the health care system for the people who are regular folks. The doctors got to express all this pain and stress they're dealing with of seeing people die every day. Nurses who are overworked, they're trying to figure out how to like even move forward with their career because they're seeing their friends get laid off and wonder, is that going to be me next? Yeah. There's some tasks that wasn't even in their resume or on the daggone job, it's like explanation list. The point is yeah. wonderful work and we all need to just say thank you and appreciate you for your services. 
So I only got two questions left. I know, I know a lot of topics, but I got two left. And oh, for sure. So, um, you know, I'll say three max, three max. I ain't gonna lie. To okay, me. no, for sure. So, I mean, where are we going, Dan? Outside is closed. You right. I'm literally gonna eat dinner and watch like another episode of Money Heist. <laughs> we all catching up on Netflix shows right now. Let's see. Um, I don't know if we touched on this a little bit earlier. But not for the people who are going through these issues, but for the spouses, the kids, the parents, mm. seeing that change within their loved one, how can they be supportive of someone who's dealing with depression or, you know, having anxiety or mood disorders or like serious mental health crises? Yeah, I think like it comes with the equal balance of just presenting the level of care, right? And so, um, I know like one of the most challenging things um, is seeing your loved one hurt in a way that you can do absolutely nothing about, right? And at that point, you also have to take care of yourself because you start questioning like, can I really hold them down like I thought I could? Because I, I, I vow to be a protector or be a confidant for them. And I feel like I'm doing everything that I can and they're still not getting better, right? So one, make sure you're taking care of yourself in that process. But the the most efficient ways that you can kind of be supportive is just the constant reassuring, right? Like consistency breeds the best results. Um, that's like a really bro gym phase. But I think that is applicable to every area of life. Like consistency breeds the best results and so even if they are not responsive to what you're saying or they are not responsive to what you're doing um eventually it's gonna come to a point where they just have to accept that you just want to love them um and even if they have cognitive distortions to say nobody's here for me nobody will ever care eventually they will get to that spot where it's just like somebody wants to love me it's, it's me that i can't feel it um and so I think being consistent in your approach, definitely um, make little things a big deal, right? So if you like maybe have a wife or a husband that is struggling with depression um, and you're just like, you know, babe, like you ate two meals today. Like, I'm really proud of you. I know how hard that was for you. And you know what I'm saying? Like, let's try to bump it to three. Like, is it something that you want to eat this week? that I can cook that you'll eat every day? Or is there a special meal that you're looking forward to that will really motivate you to keep eating? Um, is it something that your mama used to make that even if you don't want to eat, like I know, you, you know what I'm saying? Like you depressed out of your mind, but if I could find a way to replicate your mama's speech, probably where you gonna eat this whole pan, right? Like, you know, and that comes with a place of humility within yourself, being okay with taking the back seat to say, you know, even if it's not convenient for me, it's doable for me. Um, so, yeah, finding those ways are like, babe, I noticed that you've been in your pajamas all week and I know that you're not motivated, but like, I see you, you know, you put on your your good gray sweatpants today. Like, what's good? Like, what's good? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> me, like I can't wait to be a wife because I'm gonna spoil my husband, make oh, whiskey, but it's it's a long way coming. Uh, but, you know what I'm saying? So like those things, right? Like make small things a big deal, um, because they are a big deal. When you are in the middle of a crisis or you're in the middle of like your life is spinning out of control, you need something that's consistent and you need something that is going to continue to motivate you to do better. Um, so I know, I, for example, like I don't do a lot of couples therapy because I'll be honest, like marriage and family therapy is its own area of study for a reason. And it takes a lot of training to do really good couples therapy. I can do communication issues, but when you start really dabbling into like the infidelity and fertility issues, like I'm more of a heal from thyself, from thyself perspective. But when you're trying to heal two people and heal the relationship at one time. It's just really challenging. And yeah. It's not in my expertise bag yet. 